I invite you to pray with me as we begin. As the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there, but water the ground, causing it to bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so will my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish that which I have purposed and succeed in everything that I have designed. That's our confidence. We trust the promise that your word never returns empty. I thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. One question that I'm not asking in this message is, what are the natural things that a preacher can do to increase the natural knowledge and the natural feeling of his people? I have no interest in that question whatsoever. What I mean by natural the natural things that a pastor can do, the natural alterations of the mind and the heart that can happen through preaching. What I mean by natural is what Paul meant in 1 Corinthians 2.14, the natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him. And he's not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. So the natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God. What are they? The natural person does not accept them, cannot understand them. They are the content of preaching. Paul had just been referring to what he had imparted through preaching. The glories of Christ, crucified, risen, reigning, and all that God is for us in Him. For example, he had just said, the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. So among the things of the Spirit of God are the word of the cross. Or he had just said in chapter 1, verse 21, since in the wisdom of God the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. So knowing God is part of the things of the Spirit of God that the natural person cannot understand. Or he said, I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. So among the things of the Spirit of God that the natural mind cannot grasp are Jesus Christ. And he said, I imparted this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit of God interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. So this is what the natural person cannot grasp. It is spiritually discerned. So the chief And ultimate aim of preaching, namely, that people would see and savor and show the glories of Christ and all that God is for us in Him is an aim that cannot be accomplished by any natural person. It cannot happen in a preacher or a hearer who is what Paul calls a natural person. Can't happen. So I'm not asking what are the natural things that a preacher can do to increase natural knowledge and natural feeling. Preaching is not 
a subspecies of natural rhetoric. It's not a means of using language to persuade the natural mind to act differently. Rhetoric, natural oratory, can move the natural mind in stunning ways. Whole, whole movements of the world can be carried by natural rhetoric. Think Winston Churchill. Think John Kennedy. Stunning things can happen through natural speech, natural rhetoric and rhetorical skill. This natural effect on the mind is not a taste for spiritual beauty. It's not a taste of the beauty and glory and worth of God. Natural oratory does not impart the miracle of seeing and savoring and showing the glory of Christ. And therefore, Christian preaching has no interest in merely natural rhetoric. Preaching aims to bring about spiritual sight of the glories of God in Christ. It aims to awaken and sustain a spiritual taste that God is supremely beautiful and satisfying. Rhetorical successes that fall short of that are fatal, especially in the ministry, in the church. What makes preaching unique is that it is a miracle aiming to be the agent of miracles in the people. And the main miracle it aims to experience in the preacher and bring about in the people is the miracle of spiritual sight, understanding, grasping truth, and spiritual savoring, cherishing, delighting, treasuring, and spiritual showing a church radically transformed and a light to the world. Now, a word of clarification about the word spiritual. Uh, today, that word, as Paul used it, would, would not be understood. When he uses it in 1 Corinthians 2.14, the things of God are spiritually discerned. Pneumatikos anachrinitai. He does not mean that something spiritual is religious or mystical or otherworldly. That's the way most people think about spiritual. Oh, if it's religious and it's um, mystical and it's otherworldly, it's spiritual. Well, no, it's not. Instead, spiritual for Paul meant originating by the Holy Spirit and having the quality of the Holy Spirit, formed by the character of the Holy Spirit. It is super natural, wrought, shaped by the Holy Spirit. Now you can see this in Romans 8, 6 to 9. I'm just clarifying the term right now. This is kind of a parenthesis, but an important one. In, in Romans 8, 6 to 9, the natural person of 1 Corinthians 2.14 is described as the mind of the flesh as opposed to the mind of the spirit, the mind of the flesh. And the problem with the mind of the flesh is not that it is irreligious or that it fails to be mystical or that it fails to be otherworldly. In fact, the mind of the flesh may be intensely religious. The mind of the flesh may be very mystical, very otherworldly. The problem with the mind of the flesh is that it is hardened against the beauty of God, the worth of God, the authority of God. It's hard against God. It's unable to welcome and love and delight in and enjoy God. Here's what it says. The mind of the flesh is death. 
but the mind of the spirit is life and peace. The mind of the flesh is hostile to God, even in worship. The Pharisees were hostile to God, and they worshiped him all the time. They were hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot, cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if, in fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to Him. So notice, the opposite of the mind of the flesh is not a vague spirituality. It's called the mind of the Spirit, having the mind of the Spirit. And it's explained in verse 9, you, namely you who have the mind of the Spirit, you are not in the flesh, you are in the Spirit if the Spirit of God is in you. So the opposite of the natural person, the opposite of the natural person is not a religious person or a mystical person or an otherworldly person. The opposite of the natural person is a person indwelt by the Spirit, inhabited by the Holy Spirit who is active such that they are experiencing discernment by the Spirit, seeing Him for who He is, savoring Him for who He is, showing Him for who He is, because the Spirit is alive, active, dominant, working in their lives. End of clarification on the word spiritual. Spiritual means something that is originating from the Holy Spirit, shaped by the Holy Spirit, having the character of the Spirit. Now back to the distinction between rhetoric and and preaching. Rhetoric relies on natural powers, mental powers, volitional powers, emotional powers, dramatic powers powers to create natural, mental, volitional, emotional effects in people. And they can be stunning and very religious. That is not Christian preaching. What makes Christian preaching unique is that it is a miracle in the preacher aiming to be the agent of miracles in the people. And the main miracle that is being aimed at to be experienced in the preacher and to be brought about in the people is the miracle of spiritual sight and savoring and showing of the glory of God in Christ, in Scripture. Therefore, The chief and ultimate aim of preaching is not possible apart from the miraculous working of the Holy Spirit, period. There is no Christian preaching apart from the miraculous intervention of the Holy Spirit. Without his supernatural work, neither preacher nor people can see God for who he is. They cannot savor, love, delight in, treasure, honor, glorify, enjoy God for who he is. They cannot show him everything will be fake. The natural mind can only see things as foolish that are things of God. They cannot see it as precious, beautiful, satisfying, worth everything, worth dying for, living for. They can't see it that way. The natural mind cannot treasure God above all things. But when the Spirit does his miracle work through preaching, when he does his miracle work, through preaching, 
He raises the spiritually dead, Ephesians 2. He takes out the heart of stone, puts in a heart of flesh, Ezekiel 36. He goes beyond what flesh and blood can do. Peter, flesh and blood has not revealed that to you. My Father in heaven did that, Matthew 16. He shines, five, four, I've lost track. He shines out from the gospel to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ to Corinthians 4. He enlightens the eyes of the heart, Ephesians 1. And he unveils the face to see the beauty and worth of Jesus, 2 Corinthians 3.18. And this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. Verse 18 of 2 Corinthians 3. In other words, without the sovereign, life-giving, blindness-removing, heart-illumining, glory-revealing work of God's Spirit, preaching cannot achieve its aims. Indeed, it cannot exist. So, preaching is a miracle in the preacher seeking to be the agent of miracles in the people. Preaching is spiritual worship seeking spiritual worshipers. Preaching is spiritual seeing, seeking to awaken spiritual seeing. Preaching is treasuring seeking to awaken spiritual treasuring. So, to say it again, I am not asking the question, what are the natural things that a preacher can do to increase the natural knowledge and natural feeling? Here's what I'm asking. And uh, Sam, I'm, I'm rivaling you on the length of my introduction. Maybe you won't get as far as you did. Well, I am asking, how can a preacher become the means by which the Holy Spirit works the miracle of worship in the hearts of the people? How do you now, at this moment, become the means of the Holy Spirit working miracles of worship, seeing, savoring, profound life-changing transformation of your whole being. How do I preach so that it is not I, but the Spirit preaching through me? You can hear in that way of asking the question, the same question Paul asked for the whole of human life, which is why those of you who are not and do not intend to be preachers should listen to the sermon right now. Because how we answer the question, how do you preach so that you are not preaching but he is preaching, is the same as how do you change a diaper so that he is changing the diaper to the glory of God, not you. And all of life is worship. That is the way life is to be lived. Listen to Paul's description of the Christian life and hear preaching as a aspect of life. Galatians 2.20 I have been crucified with Christ it is no longer I who live, <laughs> really, but Christ who lives in me, but the life that I now live. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. The whole of everything is in that verse. How do you not live? so that he can live, and yet live so that he is living. 
We'll come back. That's what this message is intended to answer. Or, 1 Corinthians 15.10, by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain, but I worked harder than any of them, yet it was not I, but the grace that was with me. Really? I'm not preaching. I'm not preaching. But I'm preaching. <laughs> Maybe. Or 1 Corinthians 3, 6, I planted, Apollos watered, God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything but only God who gives the growth. One more. Philippians 2.12. Work out your salvation up there in the pulpit with fear and trembling. For God is the one who is at work in you to will and to work for his good pleasure. Now in each of those four texts, Galatians 2, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 Corinthians 3, Philippians 2, in each of those texts, I live And that includes preaching. In such a way that it is in some crucial sense not I preaching. But God preaching. God living. So I'm asking, how does a preacher go about this? How, how does a preacher become the means? the instrument by which the Holy Spirit works the miracle of seeing and savoring and showing the glory of Christ in the hearts of the people. That's my question. I'm done with the introduction, just posing the question. My answer to that question for the last 35 years or so has been to before preaching or other acts where I do not want to act but God act, to mentally and spiritually walk through the acronym APTAT, A-P-T-A-T. And what I want to do in the rest of this message is spend almost all of my time on the middle T, A-P-T-A-T, and how it practically works during the moments just before preaching and then during preaching. I'm trying to be as absolutely practical as I can be because I do not like platitudes of let's preach by the Spirit, live by the Spirit, walk by the Spirit, bear the fruits of the Spirit, what? Help me! What are you talking about? Words, words, words. By, by, what does by mean? Right now. Sit by the Spirit. <laughs> Listen by the Spirit. You got a, you got a handle on that? That's not simple. It won't work just to use words. You should know how to sit by the Spirit. How to get on a plane by the Spirit. Or preach by the Spirit. A-P-T-A-T. A, admit. P, pray. T, trust. A, act, T, thank. I'll say them one more time if this is new to you. My guess is it's not new to many of you. This is, this is how I try to obey the command to, to not be so that he can be. That's, 
Admit, A, P, pray, T, trust, A, act, T, think.